behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, and all my colleagues at Teamwork Arts, welcome back to JLF's Brave New World Season Two. Our magazine partner for the series is The Week: Journalism with a Human Touch. Those of you who missed our earlier episode today, Fatal Distractions, Drug, Substance Abuse, and the Media, with Neeraj Kumar and Jyotsna Mohan Bhargava in conversation with Maya Mirchandani, you can catch this on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF, and on our Facebook page. JLF Lit Fest. Our next session of the day is Cricket, the Spirit of the Game. Rajdeep Sardesai and Gideon Haig in conversation with Keshava Guha. India and Australia are both cricket obsessed nations that share an all consuming love for the sport of sports. Two brilliant experts bring the changing nature of cricket to life in an engrossing conversation. Author and news anchor Rajdeep Sardesai in his book, Democracy's 11, the great Indian cricket story, masterfully narrates the story of cricket in a post-colonial era through the lives of 11 multi-dimensional cricketers. Eminent sports journalist Gideon Haig has authored Crossing the Line, How Australian Cricket Lost Its Way, On Warren and the Cricket War. In conversation with author Keshava Guha, they discuss the spirit of the game and its evolving nature including its digital avatar in the COVID age and the change from test cricket to the multi-billion dollar enterprise of the Indian Premier League. Rajdeep Sardesai is a senior journalist, author, and TV news presenter. He's currently the consulting editor and lead news anchor of the India Today group. His latest book is 2019, How Modi Won India. His previous books include 2014, the election that changed India and Democracy's 11, the great story of Indian cricket. Gideon Haig has contributed to more than 100 newspapers and magazines and published 35 books about cricket, business, social affairs, and true crime. His latest book, This Is How I Will Strangle You, is a study of incest. Keshava Guha is a writer and editor. His novel, Accidental Magic, is set in Boston in the early 2000s in a community of adult Harry Potter obsessives. He is the fiction editor at Juggernaut Books in New Delhi. His literary and political journalism has appeared in a range of Indian and international publications. Do remember that all our sessions that have been broadcast till now are available on our Facebook page, JLF Lit Fest, and on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our Facebook and YouTube channels. And of course, if we drop off, hang in there. We'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, cricket, the spirit of the game, Rajdeep Sardesai and Gideon Haig in conversation with Keshava Guha. Rajdeep, Gideon, Keshava, over to you. Thank you, Sanjoy. Thank you to the whole team at, at JLF and JLF Brave New World. So it's, it's really a treat to be here talking with Rajdeep and Gideon about something that we, we all love. This is a kind of a sequel to a conversation that we had along with Shashi Tharoor at Jaipur back in January. And of course, we're talking about the same subject, but in very different circumstances. And we'll, and we'll come to, to all of that. But I wanted to start with where we are right now or where we're going to be in a week's time when an Indian team leaves to tour Australia. You know, of course, we've got two Indians and one Australian here in this conversation. And Australia has historically been probably the most difficult place for Asian teams to tour, certainly for India to tour. If you look at it historically, India only ever really can compete in Australia when we get lucky in some way. You know, in the 70s and 80s, you had Australian teams weakened by the Packer revolution. More recently, in 2003, Australia were missing Warren and McGrath. More recently still, in circumstances that Gideon wrote about in his recent book, Crossing the Line, India toured in 2018 with Australia missing their two best batsmen, Steve Smith and David Warner. Against a full-strength Australian team, Indian tours of Australia usually end in tears. But this time, we're hoping it's going to be different. And I think given that Australia were missing Smith and Warner last time, Cricket fans sort of hope that this will be, in a way, there's an official test championship, but this could almost be the unofficial world test championship. 
So Gideon, I wanted to start with you. This is a tour happening in very unusual circumstances. But what are, your, what, what are you looking forward to? How do you think it's going to go? What are your thoughts on, on the upcoming tour? I'm incredibly relieved that it's going ahead, Keshava. It's been touch and go at times, you know, right up until the 11th hour with quarantine issues between the various states. It was by no means certain that the tour was even going to happen uh, 10 days ago. And it's, it's exactly what the Australian game needs at the moment. After a, after a barren winter, a, a winter free, not, not entirely free of sport, but certainly free of sports participation. And I mean, I'm speaking from Melbourne and Melbourne's had the, um, borne the brunt of, of COVID in Australia. We've had more or less six months of lockdown. And it was, uh, there was a period there where it looked like we might lose the Boxing Day test, which of course was anathema to, uh, to local cricket fans. We'd already lost the AFL grand final. We've just had the Melbourne Cup, which is the premium horse race of the calendar being um, staged in front of empty stands. If we'd lost Boxing Day as well. I, I wouldn't have. I would have put all blunt instruments uh, out of out of reach. I would have. Uh, I would have felt uh, absolutely destitute. So, in a sense, the triumph is getting it started at all. Uh, and of course, the, the the prospect of India, I think these days, is almost more exciting for me than, than England being here. Whereas England have found it even tougher to, to win in Australia than, uh, than, than India historically. And India certainly in their uh, most recent incarnation under Kohli have made a point of being a great on the road team and afraid of no challenges, prepared to embrace things like the DRS, which, which previous Indian teams have been reluctant to, uh, to enfold. Uh, and prepared to go toe to toe with their competitors, uh, both uh, with bat and with with manner. So it's it's a fantastic opportunity for uh, for both sides. And I think something the public's really going to rally around this summer, with all the um, uh, difficulties and, and awkwardnesses of the of the last nine months. It's it's uh, hopefully they're going to fade away. I mean, isn't it incredible, Keshava, that we had this conversation in January? It feels like an eternity ago. It feels like another world. But um, but it's it's wonderful to get back together, even um, vicariously by by technology. And in this tour, we, we are, India's cricketers are going to be playing in front of crowds, right? Which they because in the IPL, they're playing in front of empty stadiums. And here, there are going to be reduced crowds, but there are going to be crowds. Mm. But something else. They are. It's it's actually been fascinating to watch the the teams become adjusted to uh, to playing in front of, uh, of of crowds. I mean, I watch the uh, the uh, IPL highlights most days, and I I watch most games. I don't know what it seems like to the players, but even for me, from this distance, it seems incredibly artificial. And then you have this phenomenon of the players gathering together at the end of the day's play to interview one another. And then to participate in these strange kind of synthetic press conferences, which are almost as sterile as the environment in which they're accommodated. Uh, it might be a bit of a bracing reintroduction to reality, might it, to actually play in front of a live audience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to come back to what, what'll happen, what's going to happen on the field. But Rajdeep, you know, Gideon said something very interesting, which is that he actually looks forward to a tour by India even more than a tour by England. And that really tells you about how things have changed. Yeah, if you go back, you know, your father actually, actually toured Australia, you know, in 67, 68 with an Indian team. And in those days, you know, India, for India, there was no hope of winning in Australia. For Australia, India was not a touring team that was taken seriously. So do you think that for Indian fans also now, uh, actually Australia is, has replaced Pakistan, whom we don't really play anymore, or England as our number one, the, our number one rival, the people that we, we most look forward to playing against? Uh, you know, first of all, thanks very much, uh, Keshava. Uh, Gideon, lovely to see both of you as well as uh, thank you to JLF. But look, I think let's put it in some context of what you said. My father went in 67, 68 to Australia. That was the first tour to Australia in 20 years. The previous tour was 47, 48. Uh, I think it was Bradman's last tour at home, uh, 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 last series at home. Uh, India got thrashed then. And India got thrashed in 67, 68 as well. But there was a 20-year gap for 20 years, an entire generation of Indian cricketers 
never got to tour in Australia. I don't think Polly Umriga, for example, or Vijay Manjreka, the two great cricketers of the 1950s, two of the great, two of the many great cricketers that India threw up in the 50s, Subhash Gupte, uh, never went to Australia, never toured a full, never had a, the experience of a full tour to Australia. Now, uh, the two greatest cricketers when I was growing up, Australian cricketers, Greg Chappell and Dennis Linney, never came yeah. to India. Uh, there was never a tour uh, either because uh, there was one tour in the late 70s, but they didn't come because they were part of Packer. But either way, it appeared that India was certainly not a priority for them or indeed the Australian Cricket Board. And look at how things have changed. The Australian Cricket Board, from all indications, and uh, Gideon can correct me, was desperate to have this tour, not just because you wanted to showcase cricket in COVID times, mm -hmm. but also you needed the revenues. Mm -hmm. you know, at the end of the day, India is the cash cow. I, I mean, this is what a board official told me, that the Australian cricketers struck a deal by which they said, look, okay, you don't want to hold the T20 World Cup in Australia, that's okay, but please, we need an Indian team there. We need a full test series, even if we don't have a T20 World Cup. In return, we'll make sure our cricketers are available for the IPL. That's how things have changed. I mean, the Australians have truly embraced the idea of India. Every time I see the Australians play in the IPL, and then I go back to the 70s and wonder why did the great Australian cricketers of that generation, Rodney Marsh, Greg Chappell, Dennis Linney, never come to India. You know, it, it just shows how much India is now the superpower of cricket. I think it says more about where India is yeah. in the cricketing fraternity and also suggests that maybe uh, through time, all these bridges uh, that were built or the walls that were built have slowly been dismantled. So it's great. I mean, I'm looking forward to this. It's a great way to spend winter getting up early in the morning and watching India and Australia play at 6 a.m. Indian Standard Time. Well, actually, Rajiv, I want to take that up. It's a very fascinating story that you tell. And I think some people won't be aware of some of this history, right? But so the transformation, and I, I dated really 1998, Australia toured India. It was their first full tour in 11 years since the 86 That's right. And they were the best team in the world. They'd replaced the West Indies and India beat them. And the first two tests, India won very convincingly with and, you know, Tendulkar dominating one and all of that. And after that, Australia have come every three or four years. We've gone every three or four years. We've started to do well there. But I guess the, the question, my question to you would be a bit of a chicken and egg, but is it more a story about cricket or more a story about India's rise in terms of economic growth? I mean, put another way, do we credit uh, Sachin Tendulkar or do we credit Narsamara? <laughs> Good question, to which the answer, let's credit both. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, I think you're right. I, I, you know, I think with liberalization, with the opening up of the market, uh, India discovered, in a way, cricket's commercial potential. And I think the 1996 World Cup uh, particularly was a, was a huge turning point because with uh, the kind of television coverage and the mega deals that were struck, I've often said Sachin Tendulkar was the first superstar in the age of satellite TV. So, you know, satellite TV was sort of exploding. You needed someone who was your hero for, sat for the satellite TV age. There was Tendulkar. Cricket, as a result, explodes in India in terms of the fact that you realize the commercial potential of it. Then over time, you globalize it. So first, you sort of liberalize the economy and therefore cricket sort of uh, becomes a commercial entity within India. And then you re recognize its global potential about 10 years later with the IPL coming into place. And that's when I think the Australians also realize uh, that, you know, look, we should be traveling more to India because that's where, uh, you know, that's where we can truly make the money. I mean, let's be clear, you know, it's mammon at the end of the day, which is driving this. And, and even in the 90s, I think Australian cricketers would have been reluctant at times to come to India. But by 2007, 8, you know, all the barriers had been broken. And now every Australian cricketer sort of is, uh, is part of some IPL franchise or the other, which is not true of Indian cricketers being part of any of the big bash franchises. So I think India, you're absolutely right. I think the opening up of the economy, uh, the, uh, the freeing up of the skies with satellite television, and then the emergence of global superstars like Sachin Tendulkar, and then the discovery of the IPL and T20 cricket, all very happily coincided over say, 15 years between 93 and 2008? I mean, now normally I'm, I'm the first person to draw atten attention to the role of the exchequer in, uh, in the influences on cricket. But I think I should say a word here for the cricket. The cricket's been excellent between these two countries. They play a kind of a fascinating, contrasting and complementary style. And of course, 
when I was growing up, the, that period that you kind of mentioned when when uh, India very seldom toured Australia and and Australia very seldom toured India, there was a scarcity value about this tour. The tours were fascinating. They were exotic because they happened so rarely. But now we have a different kind of context through constant competition. The more you compete, the more context you generate, the more kind of individual rivalries you build up, the more story you build. And the richer the story, the richer the cricket. I mean, it is amazing that we only had India here two years ago, two years ago, and we had four very good test matches. And we're now we're having them again, but we're still hungry for it. And it's not only for the money. We want to see Kohli again. We want to see Bumrah again. We want to see Sharma. We want to see Shami. We know these names. And of course, the, the international cricket fan these days is far, far better informed about cricket in other countries than they were in our generation growing up. So when we to see these names, to see these figures is somehow mm. that much more compelling. They, they fit into a pre-existing narrative. So sure, the money's important. It's like Willie Sutton said when he was asked about, you know, why, why did he rob banks? Because that's where the money is. Yeah. Uh, sure, we love going to India because it's, it's the biggest market in the world. It's the most compelling market in the world. It's the most cricket centric market in the world. But we go there. We also go there because we're cricket fans. We love we love the fact that Indians love cricket and uh, and and that they love Australian cricketers as well. Can I can I just add to what uh, Gideon said, Keshava? Because uh, I think the other big distinction, and this stems from what he said, uh, is that Indians who went to Australia in the sixties, seventies, even eighties, and dare I say nineties, were intimidated by the idea of going to Australia. Yeah, yeah. You know the sheer size of the ground. I remember my father telling me. The first thing that struck him when they went to Australia was the size of the grounds. Mm. And I think, you know, the bouncy pitches, these uh, reports of these, you know, Australian uh, fast bowlers, the Thompsons of the 70s. I think Indian cricketers went to Australia with a defeatist mindset, uh, you know, with the idea, can we at least draw a test match? And I think that started changing uh, in this century, you know, in the early part of the 2000s, the, the sort of Ganguly generation, I think, changed that defeatist mindset brought in a bit of self-belief. And now with the Kohli generation, they will look the Australians in the eye. You know, they are no longer intimidated by the Australians. And I think that appeals to the Australian mindset as well. That here, you know, much like the West Indies in the 70s and 80s, why did Australian crowds love the West Indies so much? You had the West Indies coming to Australia every couple of years till the Australians got tired of being beaten every time by the West Indians, I think. But for a long time, the West Indians intimidated uh, in a way, the Australians, and they liked the idea of uh, a team that was looking the Australians in the eye. I think India does that. And that's one of the changes I think that's taken place. This generation of the Kohli generation uh, will meet fire with fire. Mm. And and I think that is extremely appealing. I think that's a very perceptive point, Rajdeep, that uh, in some ways, India has replaced the West Indies in that's Australia. Right. The, the West Indies used to come here all the time in the 80s and 90s. They were... England, of course, the traditional benchmark, the traditional opponents, we, we valued the Ashes enormously. That was kind of a paramount. But for sheer excitement, those West Indies teams of the 70s, 80s and 90s were our benchmark. As the West Indies receded, India, I think, has taken up a good deal of that slack. Yeah. No, I think, I think it, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's absolutely true what Rajdeep says. And I'm sure, Rajdeep, you must have grown up on these stories. I mean, you said that we looked at, might look to draw a test, but really we were, we were clutching at individual achievements, right? Hazare is in 100 in each innings, or Prasanna taking uh, 46 wickets in eight tests in Australia and New Zealand, or even uh, Tiger Patawdi getting two attractive 50s in a test match that India lost. You know, these are the kinds of things that were talked about for decades to, uh, later in, in India. And now we're actually saying, you know, we're going there to try to win a test series, which we did last time, right? And uh, so, Giri, I wanted to, to, to ask you a little bit about you know, what what you're sort of looking forward to on the field. You know, one, you think about India and the West Indies is it part, one of the things it took was for India to start developing fast bowlers. Mm. The teams that have done well in Australia, whether it's the West Indies in the 80s, whether it's South Africa in the last 10 or 12 years when you know, had Stain or later Rabada, they've been teams with good fast bowlers. Mm. At, in England, there's an obsession with having bowlers who are quick enough to do well in Australia. Yeah. I mean, they yes. picked people in England thinking that, how will he do in Australia 18 months from now? And, yeah. you know, here it's sort of, for me, the battle between a Bumrah, Shami, Ishant, if he's fit, uh, and 
Hazelwood come in Stark, you know, that's, that, that, that seems like, it's, it's, it's extraordinary that India can go to Australia, we're actually talking about, could our pace attack be as good as the Australians? Yes, and they outbowled Australia here two years ago. I mean, I thought that that was a, that was a potential Australian trump card. You had Stark and Hazelwood and Cummins in combination who had disposed uh, peremptorily of, uh, of England in the previous summer, but they were comfortably outbowled by uh, that trio you mentioned. And the spinners with which historically India um, has been associated performed a kind of a holding operation for Kohli. I think Kohli, um, Kohli almost sometimes doesn't rate spin, perhaps because he finds it so easy to play. Uh, he actually, he's got a sort of a batsman's understanding of captaincy and the things that kind of discomfort him, he assumes, not without foundation, discomfort other, other batsmen. Uh, and he is comfortably the most compelling personality around. You know, just the sheer pleasure of writing about Coley day to day in 2018-19 was worth getting up for. There have yeah. been very few touring captains of Australia who have been just so electrifying simply by walking on the field. I'll be interested to hear, to feel whether it's different this summer, mm -hmm. because we will, to some degree, for biosecurity reasons, be insulated from the players. We probably won't be going to face-to-face -face press conferences. We'll probably see them all on Zoom. We probably won't get very close to the players at all. I'll be interested to see whether his charisma is quite so radioactive as it, uh, as it was here two years ago. But there's definitely, you know, there's... Not only does he, um, does he uh, take his troops with him, but he, he makes them feel like a combination of 12 rather than 11. He is kind of an extra man uh, in his own um, body of cricketers. You know, I, I think both of you make great points, both on Kohli and the fast bowling factor. And again, it comes back to this notion of intimidation. Yeah, yeah. You know, a, let, let me be very clear. I mean, watching Kohli during the IPL, he still has... A, in the, in the fact that there are no crowds haven't mattered to him. You mm -hmm. know, he's been still uh, in your face, aggressive. Uh, his form was not always the greatest, despite that, you know, uh, you can clearly see that the body language is of someone fully involved in the game. So I don't expect Kohli to take a step back simply mm -hmm. because we are in a biosecurity atmosphere. And that's the good news. And mm -hmm. the other news, as Keshava put it, is the emergence of India as a fast bowlers nation. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, all these romantic stories were spun literally around our spinners in the 60s and 70s, and they were terrific bowlers. But, you know, spin doesn't intimidate quite like fast bowling does. It doesn't sort of excite you in the way that fast bow uh, bowling can. You know, the idea of a fast bowler looking at a batsman in the eye after having bowled a bouncer at him. There's something about it that sort of brings out uh, the real raw energy of cricket. In a way that a spin bowler, you know, much more about craft and about the mind. Uh, fast bowling is much more about the muscle. And to think that Indian cricketers, who were traditionally seen as timid and inferior in some way, and I think the Australians also saw the sort of prototype of an Indian cricketer as being relatively timid. The idea that you now have the Bumras and the Shamis, I think has dramatically changed the equation. I think that's an important element of making Indian cricket more attractive. The fact that we now have fast bowlers who can fight fire with fire. Makes mm. a huge difference, I think, to the game. And Kohli, you're right. I think Kohli also backs fast bowlers uh, more mm. than he would probably a spinner. And I'll tell you, Ravi Shastri, uh, who is a cricketer from a previous age, told me that he believes you can only really win in Australia when you have fast bowlers. Mm. You could never really take on the Australians in the 70s and 80s, even though we had great batsmen, because we didn't have the bowling to bowl the Australians out twice on Australian wickets. Now we can. And I think that has changed for India, the rules of the game overseas. That's why we are now tigers abroad, yeah. uh, where once we were lambs. I'll say one other, one other quality that, um, that I felt was distinctive about the last Indian team to tour Australia was as, its athleticism. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, historically, we have associated um, uh, Indian cricketers with very high levels of skill, but they aren't necessarily athletes at the same time. Of course, Kohli is the, the prototypical modern athlete. He's absolutely dedicated body and soul to his craft and to, and to maximising his, uh, his physical potential. Uh, Dhoni was like that too, but I don't think Dhoni had the same degree of expectation that Kohli does of his, uh, of, his, of his contemporaries. He sets a standard that he expects others to live up to. Yeah, the, can, I, can, I share a, can I share an anecdote on this? which in a sense typifies how times have changed. 67, 68, my father, who was rather rotund by then, 
wasn't exactly the most athletic uh, fielder that you had. Played a test match at Adelaide. And Adelaide has long straight boundaries. Yeah. And I think Doug Waters or someone hit a straight drive. And as the ball was approaching the boundary, uh, they were about to take a fifth run when my father kicked the ball over the boundary uh, so that they only took four. Uh, so that it was a boundary. It was typical Indian street smart way of approaching the game, but also showed the lack of athleticism. It's a story that Bishan Bedi tells me rolling over, but that's Indian cricket of the time. You know, we never dived. The idea of Indian cricketers diving, the idea of Indian cricketers taking these spectacular catches in the deep. We had very good forward short leg fielders and slip fielders, but not really in the outfield. And I think that's, again, a huge change that's taken place. I think as the game professionalized, uh, you know, being an athlete became an important element. I have no doubt that the cricketers of 60s and 70s, if they were offered far more incentives to play the game than they are today, uh, 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 were offered far more incentives then as they are today, they would have been fit. But in, yeah. at that time, there was an amateurism, I think, about Indian sport. And athleticism was, as a result, a casualty of that amateur spirit. I think that I think Gideon's point about Dhoni and Kohli is a very interesting one. You know, they are both very successful captains, but extremely, I mean, you, they could not be more contrasting in terms of their style or their personality. And actually, Kohli made his captaincy debut in Australia in 2014-15 when Dhoni sort of retired mid-series. And after that series, he said something very interesting. India lost 2-0. And he said, I've told our fast bowlers, who were then Shami, not Bumrah yet, but Shami, Ishant, Umesh, Look at Hazelwood. He bowls six good balls and over. You guys bowl one ball on the pads. And what was very really interesting is Kohli said, the reason for this is that he's not more skilled than you. He's fitter than you. Mm -hmm. And it's with fitness that you'll get that consistency. And he pushed particularly Shami, Ishant, later Bumra to match his own fitness levels. Dhoni sort of said, you're a grown-up. Take care of yourself. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll set a standard, but I, don't, I won't sort of force you to, to do the same. Now, Rajdeep, you're one of the few people who spent time with both of these guys in writing your book. You've studied them, their different styles. So, uh, what you, you know, what, what the time you spent with them, what light did that shed on them as people, as captains? You know, it's a, uh, it's, it is fascinating because I think Kohli, uh, you know, exemplifies the complete professionalization of an elite athlete. So, when I asked him the story on fitness, he was not measuring his fitness against fellow cricketers. He said, I look at Novak Djokovic. You know, I'm looking at a Grand Slam champion and saying, what can I do to become a sort of Grand Slam champion in the world of cricket? Now, I don't think Dhoni's worldview extended there. You know, mm -hmm. Dhoni, in a sense, is a bit of a connect with the past era of the most street smart cricketer. You know, I think uh, in Rachi, while he played the game hard, was naturally a sort of muscular young man. I don't think he worked at fitness as part of his daily regimen. So I think Dhoni represents to that, you know, to some extent, a connect with the amateur age of the 70s and 80s, you know, played the game for a laugh. And in fact, when I asked Dhoni, what will you do post cricket? He said, I'll have nothing to do with the game. You know, I, I want to enjoy life. I don't think Kohli is about that. You know, Kohli is about, I want to make sure that this is the greatest ever Indian team uh, this will be recognized 30 years ago, 30 years later as the greatest Indian team there ever was. Uh, I want to be seen as a batsman who took fitness to another level. Uh, and as his fitness trainer told me now, you will have to look at Indian cricket as before Kohli and after Kohli, purely in terms of, of, of fitness. I don't think uh, 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 Dhoni saw cricket in those terms. You know, Dhoni was very much part of someone who'd come through a, a, a small town a boy who was just happy that he was there on this big stage and enjoyed every moment of it. You know, uh, thereby was able to sort of uh, take in the pressure also rather well because there was a calmness to him. He was just happy at being where he was. Uh, while for Dhoni, uh, for, while for Kohli, I think he carries this uh, this sort of new Indian metropolitan aggression. You know, the, the sort of suburban aggression of Delhi you know, this new Vikas Puri aggression, I'm going to make it at all costs. Uh, and I think there's a difference in that. And, and, I, and I think that shows in their captaincy where Dhoni is much more relaxed, Kohli is much more aggressive and in your face. Uh, he won't give an inch on a cricket field, uh, uh, Kohli. Not, a, not an inch to anyone. It's his strength and his weakness. I think he gets at times too, too involved uh, mm. in the game. So he's not able to step back. 
which is why i think sometimes a, you know his captaincy his over aggression can actually uh, be a bit of a liability for an indian team but i it's it's lovely to watch you know it's fascinating and as a batsman absolute killer on the ground i mean there's the story again that he scored uh, i think a double century in the humid heat of of mumbai 3 or 4 years ago against england and then allowed himself after after weeks uh, to have a proper meal of a sort of burger but remove the bread because you know that was seen as something that might sort of not be part of his fitness regimen i can see dhoni after scoring 100 having butter chicken yeah. <laughs> i can't see kohli doing that Steve Smith awards himself a huge block of chocolate when he gets a big score. I can't, can't, certainly can't see Coley doing that. Yeah. <laughs> no, he might. But he might just have a spoon. He won't have a full chocolate ice cream. Well, that being to see what the impact on Coley is of becoming a father. Yeah, course, yeah. Become a father in January, and I, that's that's changed more than a few players in in my experience. Um, they 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 always said that Merv Hughes was never quite the same. cricketer after he became a father or a different kind of cricketer he lost some of that uh, that abrasive edge he found it difficult to access that part of himself i don't think that will happen to coley but certainly that will introduce him to worlds that that he has never previously fathomed that's what fatherhood's all about he seems to smile a lot more i see uh, virat seems to smile a lot more you know he's he's wonderful in interviews i think he you know he under he he's a you know he is a student of the game Yes. uh as dhoni is maybe both of them perhaps have, uh, are are not as connected to the history of the game and i think that's one thing that's often missing in contemporary cricketers i don't know whether dhoni knows that vijay hazare for example yeah. as keshava mentioned scored uh, you know a century in each innings at adelaide but i think he is very respectful of the game and its traditions in particular test cricket and that's the great part you know here is a cricketer three in one cricketer t20 odis test but believes that test cricket is the ultimate test mm. and i think therefore is a great role model for cricketers of the future because too many young indian cricketers are coming in i think at times believing that t20 is where i need to make a mark and uh, i think kohli still represents that sort of respect for test cricket which is delightful uh, in a way particularly for romantics like us which a hunger for greatness yeah. that's right and- while while t20 can offer you spectacle and excitement it's not i think quite a big enough canvas for for genuine greatness most of the players who've been really accomplished at t20 have been great players when they arrived i've yet to see a case of a player who's become great through t20 alone hmm yeah that, that that's fascinating because you know i think somewhere i think ankeshwa maybe we need to look at that that you know while all the focus has been on the ipl Yeah. Uh you know what troubles me about covid times is that there is no talk of how are we going to revive domestic cricket. Yeah, yeah. You know we don't know whether we're going to have a Ranji trophy season this year or all the matches and that worries me that while the focus is on IPL and yes going to Australia what about building the next generation of cricketers through domestic cricket. So I think that's going to be a huge challenge franchise cricket as it keeps growing we, we might have another IPL in a few months we're told in yeah. March so mm-hmm. the excessive focus on on franchise cricket and t20 at the cost of longer format is something that we're going to have to uh, struggle to live with i guess that it takes me to where i what i wanted to talk about next which is that you know historians have been talking about past pandemics world wars similar events and, and one of the things that they they say is that these don't they tend to accelerate existing trends mm. rather than sort of create new ones and even before covid-19 you know the ipl was going from strength to strength every year and in every sense the ipl is a is a, is a huge money maker for the owners right people think that people want to own ipl teams for glamour and spectacle no they make real profits you know serious money uh, from the ipl and test cricket outside of india australia england was struggling and if you think about what's happening to businesses you know stronger getting stronger the weaker getting weaker and sort of industry after industry uh, in other sports you know the english premier league might do well but smaller leagues in smaller european countries or south america clubs are struggling struggle to survive so it's i think it's possible that the long term trend of the acceleration of ipl the decline of test cricket might actually get worse with uh, with this i mean gideon is that how you see it yes i do and you know one of the 
things that it's done most clearly, uh, COVID-19, is just reveal what a mockery the World Test Championship is. Yeah. There's only ever really three teams in it. And now, lo and behold, there are three teams in it. And Bangladesh have played, what, two test matches in the, um, in the, in the relevant span? They were never competitive. They're actually not a bad team when they, uh, when they get the opportunity to play, but they're just not in the running. You can't have a championship where teams play a different number of games. It might be the case that England gets into the final just simply because they've played like 15 test matches rather than 10 test matches. That's yeah. just absurd. Uh, so it was always an anachronism and the scoring system was ridiculous. And it was a, it was a half-hearted effort that now looks like a quarter-hearted effort as a result of, of what's transpired over the last year. And conversely, but the, but, the, but the imperative, of course, the commercial imperative was to get India into the final. So in that respect, it's fulfilled its design. You know, it's, it, it's also difficult, uh, uh, Keshavatu, because of the sheer volume of monies involved yeah. in, in the IPL at the moment to sort of believe that we can, uh, that, that we can actually uh, sort of put test cricket on the front foot and somewhere sort of look at IPL as an add-on. The fact is the IPL has over time become the main course. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, that is for, for a younger cricketer. I'll give you the example of this fascinating story of this cricketer team, Natarajan, mm -hmm. you know, who's playing for the Hyderabad Sunrisers. Mm -hmm. Parents owned a little chicken shop, roadside chicken shop in a village in Tamil Nadu. Now, he's become a specialist death bowler in the IPL with his Yorkers. And, you know, he can, have, he can have a full cricket career, probably uh, traveling eventually to other franchises as a specialist death bowler. And thereby will inspire probably other kids to follow his path. Where 10, 20 years ago, the path they would follow was either the Dhoni path of, you know, lifting the World Cup and sort of uh, being, you know, taking India to number one in test play uh, as a test playing nation or the Kohli part, which is to become, you know, the number one test batsman in the world. So you've got new heroes being created, new role models being created, and it's difficult to then resist the temptation uh, for others uh, coming in from the smaller towns. So I think it's going to be more and more difficult to achieve that right balance. And that's the real struggle that BCCI and other cricket boards will have. And I really worry about the BCCI in that regard as well at times. That, you know, will they eventually end up... I mean, they've already to some extent uh, sort of uh, diluted Ranji Trophy cricket. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, they need to do much more for Ranji Trophy cricket. We have a strong junior system in India, under 15, under 17, under 19. But we destroyed university cricket. And now my worry is at some stage... Uh, we aren't doing enough for Ranji Trophy cricket as well. We need to make a more exciting format for our first-class game in this country to encourage uh, people to sort of value winning the Ranji Trophy for Bombay, as my father's generation did, as much as sort of winning the IPL for the Mumbai Indians. The resources, the playing resources of India, though, to an Australian just seem completely staggering. The number of first-class teams that you have to draw on. Well, we have six states. We have sure. six states. And when we... When we created the Big Bash League and extended it to eight franchises, we diluted the strength of, of, of our domestic T20. India consolidates its strengths. It gets eight franchises out of 30-odd first-class teams. So the quality of the, of the domestic T20 that India is playing is, is outstanding. I find the, this IPL particularly compelling. And ours is a rather washed-out, um, rather tepid version of the uh, of the saying, and we used to flatter ourselves that the BBL was was a direct competitor to the IPL, but I don't think that's the case anymore. Mm. And, and and I'm also fascinated, uh, Keshava Gideon, by the number of young 16 year old, 17, 18 year old Indian batsmen who play the reverse sweep with such aplomb. Oh. Uh, you know, it is uh, they are fearless. I mean, I yeah. think the one thing about the modern day batsman, and I think that's the positive that T20 has done. Uh, in a way, has brought a level of fearlessness to the sport, to the way they play the game. I mean, you know, you've got prototype AB De Villiers all over uh, Indian, uh, uh, you know, Indian team in, in a several of our young Indian cricketers. They're staggeringly good, uh, and 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 they hit the ball hard. Uh, my only worry is, will they, you know, maybe uh, maybe I'm being a romantic here, but the 70s, you know, Sunil Gavaskar wearing down the opposition on a tough wicket. Uh, in uh, in a test match in the West Indies or at Bangalore, that great innings that he played against 
Qasim and Kader in his last test. I mean, will we produce those kind of batsmen anymore? I don't mm. know. I, I mean, the jury is out. I guess the, the, the nature of batsmanship has changed. So maybe I'm being a bit unfair. But I worry at times that will T20 completely sort of change the rules of the game to the point where the, where the nature of test cricket for the young Indian cricketer uh, becomes not irrelevant, but certainly not as important as scoring a match-winning IPL innings. The thing is that you've got such massive riches, though. You can afford to be wasteful with them. <laughs> uh, you know, I was very impressed a few years ago, a couple of years ago, when um, when India called up Mayank Agarwal out of domestic cricket and dropped him straight into a Boxing Day Test match. Yeah. Uh, and I, he just... He had no previous experience of Australian conditions. He dropped straight in and looked the part straight away. Technically very proficient, very patient, knew how to organise innings. And I've watched him over the last couple of years massively expand his game. I mean, he's hugely gifted. That's a great advertisement for the Indian domestic cricket scene, that you can produce ready-made players like that and put them into international competition. And there doesn't seem to be any noticeable step up. No, so I kudos to you for, from that point of view. I've been following my you know, he's also from Bangalore since he was playing in school. And he was seen as a T20 specialist when he started. I mean, he was seen as a new seva. And in the Ranji Trophy, he was able to refine his game playing for Karnataka and arrive in the MCG and know where his off-stamp was and have great discipline, as you said. But, but, but let me give the flip side of another Bangalore boy, Keshava, which is KL Rahul. Yeah. You know, when I first saw him, I saw him as a 10,000-plus te test cricketer, yeah. you know, in the Rahul Dravid League. Yeah. Uh, you know, that kind of a player. He... And, and he uses class even today when you watch him back. Yes. But I somewhere fear that he's had no time to work on his game. You see, I think one of the things that hopefully COVID does is if there is less cricket, you know, in terms of not every week playing the game, you can actually have time to sit in the nets or at, your, at home and work at your game. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think young cricketers get that opportunity. Uh, at times. And I think Rahul suffered a bit as a result because certain bad habits crept in, which will creep in if you play T20 all the time. So I think he's the other, the other example. Mayank Agarwal is a good example of someone who spent, what did he spend, about 8-10 years playing yeah, for Karnataka before he was picked for India. I think that makes a huge difference. So he was yeah. picked in his la latter half of his 20s. I, I mean, maybe I'm exaggerating my fears here because Gideon is right. The quality of riches in Indian cricket is incredible. Uh, you see them all coming in from small towns, the so-called dhonification of yeah. Indian cricket, which I think is the real phenomenon of yeah. our times. You know, uh, 1971, India beats England in England and the West Indies. In England, we had out of the 11, six players were from Mumbai. Yeah. Uh, by today, you will have one or two from Mumbai and the rest from all, all over the country. I think that is the real story uh, of, of Indian cricket that I don't think, and the reason why Indian cricket is number one today. I think the moment we broke the metropolitan monopoly, I think we became number one. Uh, I should just quickly say on that. I've got a question for both of you, though. Is yes. there, has, a, has a bifurcation opened up between batting and bowling? Are the riches now reserved for the, for the batsman, the prestige reserved for the batsman? Uh, you spoke before about Natarajan, um, you know, having um, come from his Japati stall and, uh, and, and made a living out of cricket. But he's a death bowler. And death bowlers seem to have relatively short lives. It doesn't take long for batsmen to work them out. They probably have two or three years where they're really effective and then they're kind of discarded. Do you foresee the time coming where everyone aspires to be a batsman? Because that's the, that's the, that's the smart vocational choice. Mm. And bowling is not the kind of area where you can carve out a long-term career, where you have, of course, the risk of injury at the same time. You have um, uh, the vicissitudes of selection. Um, I'm just wondering whether we've created a kind of a two-speed economy where the riches will naturally accrue to batsmen rather than to bowlers. Ishwa? I mean, I, I, think, I think Indian cricket has always had that, has always had that bias. Yeah. Like, you know, it's, it's a natural thing. The, the biggest stars, you know, Sachin, uh, Kohli, etc. I just want to say one thing quickly on that, actually, because Rajdi brought, mentioned the 70-71. Uh, and of course, you know, Rajdi, father, your father was top scorer in both those test victories. You know, both at the Oval and uh, and at uh, Port of Spain, right? Because he got a hundred at Port of Spain, and I think he's the only guy who got fifty at the. That's uh, you know, they, that's right. I think I think there was I think Engineer also got a fifty at the Oval, and maybe Solker also. But you're right, he got a hundred at uh, in the one that we won in uh, in uh, in the West Indies and a fifty in in England. Yeah, 
Yeah, but certainly, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, the, I think the riches of Indian cricket have always been a bad thing. Okay, so we're almost out of time. I want to ask each of you a couple of quick ones before we end. And so the first is I want to ask you to to pick your how you think the IPL is going to go. Who do you who do you see winning? Rajdeep, you want to go first? Uh, look, I want a new team to win. I I like the idea that the IPL is not like the English Premier League, where you know the battle is fought between the top three or four teams every year in football. Uh, I'd like to see. You know, I, having lived in Delhi 25 years and the city has been good to me, uh, I would like to see the Delhi Capitals win. Uh, and Or I, I would like to see your home city, Royal Challengers Bangalore, because I sense that they are the one franchise which seems to have this frenzied support for it. I don't think they... And, and that's part of the game, right? That your, your generation, Keshava, if I may say so, is unlikely to go and watch a Karnataka versus Mumbai final in, at the Chinnaswamy. But you can bet your top dollar that if there was an IPL final with RCB, they'd all be there. So I'm going for either RCB or uh, uh, Delhi Capitals, two teams that haven't won the trophy that are in the in the last four. I think it's important that there's one team that never wins because you want to remain a never-ending quest for the Grail. Uh, and if it has to be anyone, I think it should be RCB because they've, you know, they just had so many advantages. They've had such a talented squad for so long, and somehow they they can't crack it. I would actually, just for the sake of variety, I'll say Sunrises. I actually really, you know, I really like Sunrises as a as a team. I really like the fact that um, that they've they've come home with a wet sail. Um, they've uh, Warner's played with such so compellingly. Um, I'm really. Um, I've actually found the the, uh, the IPL quite compelling to watch um, uh, this summer, or this this winter, or whatever season it is that's uh, that's that, that's um, it, that we're calling it. Um, and can I, I mean, can I just add can I can I just add a small line to your point on Warner? I mean, look at the fascinating aspect. Here is someone who's seen otherwise as the bad boy in the way of Australian cricket, but embraced by Sunrisers Hyderabad and actually seems to revel in captaincy of yeah. Sunrisers Hyderabad, like few other international captains have yeah. of an Indian franchise. You know, I uh, speaking to VVS Lakshman uh, a few uh, months ago, you know, he said Warner was actually looking forward to the idea of captaining Sunrisers. Yeah. You know, it's given yeah. him a sort of new lease of life, not just now, but over the last few years, remarkably successful. And, you know, the Hyderabadis have really warmed to him. So I think that's again a barrier that's been broken. You know, yeah. the fact that you now get to see these Indian cricketers, uh, these Australians in flesh and blood playing for an Indian franchise. I think all the barriers that existed, the distance between Australia and India, the tyranny of distance. Uh-oh. I think we've lost. Uh, I think we've lost uh, Rajdeep momentarily. But I will say, I will say from the point of view of Warner, a, a very shrewd Australian cricketer, a very shrewd teammate of Warner's once said to me that, Water made a much better captain than he did a vice captain. <laughs> he didn't have enough to do, and he tended to focus his aggression on the opposition. When yeah. he was captain, he enjoyed a natural authority, and he tended to look after his own teammates. Um, that's, that's interesting. He might end up being one of the best Australian captains that that never led his country. Along with L- like your old friend Shane Warne. Exactly. Indeed, Warne and Warner. One very one one very final one. Just just put you on the spot. Uh, prediction for the Test series, Gideon. How do you, do you do you think India can win? I do, I do, I do think that Australia will start favourite. I think over the last couple of years they've played some they've played some pretty good cricket. I think under Payne they've become a pretty resourceful outfit. It was a hugely impressive feat for India to win here two years ago. Uh, even when Smith and Warner were absent, you know Australian conditions are a massive advantage to us. There's no there's no two ways about it. I think Australia starts favourite, and I think Coley will have to make more runs than he did here two years ago. I think he's going to be a much more important wicket. They, can I see Pajara doing the same as he did two years ago? That was such an astonishing series that that he played. The stars really aligned in India's favour. You know, certain key players probably outperformed their own expectations. Can they double up? Well, they'll want to with uh, against an Australia that includes Smith and Warner. Right. Well, I think uh, the key actually lies in two people who've not played the IPL. One is Pujara, who's the sort of refreshing contrast to all else you see around you in this age of sort of, you know, big bats and hitting the ball uh, for sixes all the time. And the other from the Australian side is Manas Labushan, 
yeah. uh, you know, who from the very first time I saw him, and I sort of occasionally get it right. Uh, I thought he had class in him, and I see him getting better and better. If he gets runs for Australia, that will reduce the pressure on Warner and Smith to produce, and I think that will give the Australians the edge. If Pujara is able to have a series anywhere close to what he had a couple of years ago, I think that will reduce the pressure on Kohli uh, uh, to sort of deliver all the time. Therefore, I'm I'm going for a two-two. I think yeah. the best two teams of the world. You know, it's it's a bit like Frazier versus Mohammad Ali. Fifteen rounds. You don't want to choose a winner. <laughs> yeah, I, I, mean, I have to say in the thirty the time I've been watching cricket, uh, I've never. What's your prediction? I, I, you know, at the time I've been watching cricket, I don't think I've ever seen a batsman as good as Steve Smith. I think when we when we look back at the end of his, end of his career, I think he's going to be second to Bradman, certainly in Test cricket. Uh, nobody knows how to get him out, uh, and uh, you know you bowl bowl to his pads, goes to mid wicket for four. You know he's he's such a unique. He's he's almost like a Mur- Murli Tharan of, of of batting, right? In that sense. Can so, I can I just add can I just add to that? If my old coach Vasan Damladi in Mumbai had seen Steve Smith bat, he would have sent him out and told him come back again when you've got your technique right. Yeah. You know, I think I think Steve Smith is again a wonderful sort of uh, you know reminder that you can play the same game in hundred different ways. You know, there are nine ways to skin a cat, and uh, the one thing he knows is how to score runs, and that. That is a remarkable gift to have, to and to be able to know how to score runs. Australia. So he versus Kohli, he versus Kohli will be a big battle. You see, Australia have added Lam Lam Singh. They've got Warner back. So I think I think I see Australia winning two one or three one. But 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 we'll see. Anyway, so we could keep going, but it's always lovely to talk cricket with you guys. And uh, thank you, Gideon. Thank you, Rajdeep. Thank you, uh, thank you Rajdeep, Sardesai, Gideon Haig, and Keshava for that absolutely brilliant session. looking forward to the india australia tour and good to know that cricket has broken every boundary of class caste the divide between urban and semi urban and of course religion and more importantly has brought two nations together australia and india thank you all very much really a, many apologies for not taking any questions in this uh, session uh it was really brilliant and didn't, we didn't want to interrupt them they were in full flow they could have carried on till the series actually started in australia but thank you all for watching and please do remember to log back tomorrow saturday 7th of november at 7:30 pm ist for the jlf voices of faith series the ram charit manas then and now pavan k varma and pragya tiwari in conversation Uh, Tulsi Das's Ram Charit Manas has highlighted Lord Ram's immense faith and belief in the concept of dharma, the ideas of the utopian society that Lord Ram strove for, uh, strove for within these verses has since then generated the notion of Ram Rajya. Pragya Tiwari and Pavan K Varma together discuss the foundations of Ram Rajya, what it signifies, and its enduring place in Indian polity. Also, a reminder to block your dates for JLF North America, which will star Nobel laureates, Man Booker, and Pulitzer Prize winners Eric Cornell, Yen Martel, Homi Baba, Michael Sandel, William Caleb, McDaniel, Vijay Shashadri, Stephen Greenblatt, Amish Tripathi, uh, Ira Mukherjee, and so many other speakers to discuss issues including the ongoing United States of America elections, the Black Lives Matter. environment history science travel nation and identity fiction and poetry we start with jlf colorado 8 to the 11th and 15 to the 18th of november we move on to jlf houston 21st to the 22nd november and on to jlf new york 23rd and 24th of november and we conclude jlf toronto 27th to the 29th november so do block your dates and till we see you tomorrow stay safe stay masked Thank you.